top category guy. Okay. Everyone see my screen okay? Yep. All right, let's get this show on the road. <laughs> uh, so apologies for those on YouTube, but also those here in Zoom. We had a bit of a technical issue a moment ago, so just a few minutes uh, lagging behind. Uh, so we'll try and get through this bit quickly so we can get to uh, some of the other speakers we've got and, and more importantly onto our presenter today, which is uh, Jan Carell, uh, talking about Excel VBA tips and tricks and also some formula auditing, which I'll uh, let Jan Carell get through that stuff himself. Uh, pretty much the usual talk from me for those who are used to this stuff. So first of all, upcoming events, uh, which currently we've only got stuff scheduled for next month or, or this month actually, as it is now, uh, believe it or not. Uh, so we've got to get that kind of sorted. But as many of you will know, uh, and if you don't, here comes the info, uh, that next week uh, we have the Global Excel Summit uh, coming in, which is the 9th to the 11th, which is the Wednesday to the Friday. Uh, so this is a, Huge event, which I'm about to say more on in a moment. Uh, so for now, I'll just move on and say that on the 22nd of February, uh, we have David Langer joining us for some hands-on data literacy. It's another online event. So Zoom, YouTube, just like this one. Um, and for those who are in the UK or near London. Coming in, which is the 9th to the 11th, which is, uh, we have in-person uh, <laughs> technical stuff's good. Uh, in-person stuff coming back soon as well. So talking about the summit, you know, many of you on this call will be very familiar with this. Some of you are speakers there who are on this call right now. Uh, but for those especially who might be finding out about it the first time, so it happens next week. Uh, I've got ticket prices at the bottom and there's a discount code with Alan 10, as the arrow says. It's a huge event, which is all done online. It's got 20 plus main stage sessions from various presenters um, and they're all recorded. For those who got a ticket, so if you can't make it during the during the time, whether it's because you're busy working or due to time zones, uh, all of that is recorded to catch up on. Uh, there are panel discussions, there are expert battles, which you're going to hear more about in a moment, and uh, from someone we've got to speak, uh, organised by the Financial Modelling World Cup group. Uh, there's some virtual networking, which is something I personally always enjoy. Uh, it's a great chance to meet other folk in there, uh, find out what they do. You know, there's, there's going to be a lot of people there from all walks of life or who uh, use Excel in some way. This is a great chance to build up that networking, get some LinkedIn connections, or just, we'll just have a chat with some people, which is nice. Uh, masterclass sessions, proper training sessions, six of those. Um, they come at an additional cost. There are some, you can get MOS certified for some lounge rooms. There are demos, both live and interactive. And finally, for those interested in it, uh, by attending, you get a certificate of attendance, showing proof of your learning and your commitment to such things uh, for work, uh, including getting CPD points, if that is something you're interested in. Uh, so there'll be a link in the, the chat, I'll put one there soon, if it's not there already, uh, to find out about this kind of stuff. Probably mistyped. Um, yeah, find out about that. More information on that soon too. Uh, more to this meetup. Uh, this is live and recorded on YouTube, which as I've said to the guys watching it there, we're slightly delayed on that uh, due to something that happened here.
But for those who need to dip out at any point, you know, this is all recorded. The link for YouTube, which I think Tay has put in the, the group, um, is also on the meetup page. So the same link that shows it live is the same link with the recording. So it will be sent after the meetup as well, but it's also already on the meetup page. If you want to kind of store that, uh, which it says there. And the follow up information um, you will only receive if you've RSVP'd to this event on the London Excel meetup group. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to RSVP to join. So you can click the link from there. Uh, but you need to, to receive a follow-up email with some of this information that I'm talking about now, plus the YouTube recording and whatever else we feel like sharing, really. Uh, so uh, that is enough from me. But just before we hand to Yang Carell, if I stop sharing for a moment, uh, I'd like to introduce Max, who just wants to come and say a few words um, about those expert battles which are going on at the Global Excel Summit next week. Uh, so, so Max, are you, you okay to take over? Yeah, sure. Hey everyone, it's uh, nice to meet you guys. Uh, I'm, I'm first time attending this session. It's uh, nice to see uh, uh, kind of uh, well-known faces here. So uh, uh, my name is Max, I represent uh, Financial Modeling World Cup. I'm Chief Operating uh, Officer here. And I just wanted to share a couple of uh, thoughts on what the expert battles are going to be during the Global Excel Summit and probably introduce you to Financial Modeling World Cup. So probably some of you have heard at least something or seen a video of uh, Excel as esports type of battle on YouTube. But generally, Financial Modeling World Cup is the financial modeling competition that is kind of taken over of uh, model of, of we started in 2020 and we lead basically financial modeling contests for analysts cfos or other financial related folks all over the globe the competition have take place every month it runs for two hours and it consolidates challenging cases to be done from different finance related topics um this year we also run the competition for the season 2022. We've had we've got $25,000 prize, um, transparent rankings that are shown uh, on our homepage that are posted every stage. So if you were to you know compete and want to compare your skill against you know other financial modelers or contestants in the world, that's you're fine to do that. There are also various training opportunities uh, by filling up the cases or. You know that, that that's kind of thing when you learn by doing so i think we we have learned excel most of us learned excel just by doing those things ourselves so there is uh, either excel type of tasks or there are finance related tasks that you can practice and get better at and there is always the community type of things because uh, the people that are competing were usually and and, and very often engaged with them uh, you know, ask them to participate in the battles, uh, lead case walk through discussions and sessions like the Excel meetup session. So it's a great opportunity to get to know new people and, you know, maybe work together in, in, in some point of life. So the, the, the other thing is that we have launched last year was the Excel as esports type of thing. So we're financed, we're sponsored by Microsoft. And this is the event that the firstly started last year in June. And that was the battle of financial individuals, finance experts doing different types of things, different types of cases. And last, uh, at the end of the 2021, we've done the Excel Esports battle, which were related only to Excel type of thing. So there was no finance related. And basically people were doing different cases under time pressure in 30 minutes and they were live stream on youtube there were two hosts um actually we had bill jalan mr excel we've got team hank from some products and other excel mvps uh, like ozdu salel danielson Pechus, commenting other people participate uh, other participants doing the cases generally participants are required to do different types of 
you know, games or, or similar type of tasks in like 10 to 30 minutes. And it's, it might be quite challenging. Like, for example, you know, there was this, this challenge, like a bowling game, right? So you, you have 10 minutes to calculate the 100 games and you need to score how much points each game is going to be scored. And it might sound easy if you do that under like, you know, in, in, in a couple of hours, but it's quite challenging to do this real quick. You have to come out with the most efficient solution. You have to recall all the formulas, you know, and the different types of Excel features and for sure use all the hotkeys. So it's quite entertaining to watch other professionals and actually practitioners doing this under time pressure. At the Excel Global Summit, uh, actually Global Excel Summit, uh, we're going to have FMWC expert battles. We have eight participants. There will be two sessions, one in the morning. It's 10 a.m. Um, UTC. And the other one starts at, uh, I guess, 5 p.m. UTC. The participants are regular uh, contestants that are that have proven that their skill is, uh, w- well, it's pretty at high level. They score pretty well at the regular season. And that will be doing it live. So for people from outside, it will be a great possibility to watch how other professionals are doing Excel at a competitive level. And for sure, this will be all commented by greatest by our great hosts. Alan Murray, by the way, is one of the hosts for the first session, which is going to take place at 10 a.m. And the other host is John Campora, who is the founder of Excel Compass. He's going to lead the evening session, and Andrew Grigunovich is the uh, represents the Financial Modeling World Cup. He will be present at the both of the sessions as the second host. Are doing Excel. So this is uh, uh, this is exciting opportunity to actually watch something different from just you know regular theoretical or or part of Excel. Or that's a possibility to actually see other professionals doing this. Uh, really well and we've been doing this by ourselves some time some time ago and now we run this competition pretty happy to share this knowledge with all the viewers and people willing and, and actually people willing to join you can either like sign up for the regular competition or follow us on social media for the next battles so you might be invited to compete as well so if you have any questions i'm free to I'm all pretty open to answer. If not, then we can probably move forward. Super, thanks, Max. Um, I know you've got to shoot off soon as well, haven't you? <laughs> uh, still in delay in that. Uh, yeah, so there's a link to the Global Excel Summit in the chat. You know, for those interested in seeing this, um, as Max says, there's a YouTube channel for Financial Modeling World Cup. You can go and watch some of the videos, past events, get a feel for it. Uh, so it is something a little bit different, something exciting to either take part in and compete maybe, or I say attend the summit next next week and see it for real. See how quick these guys work. Yeah. <laughs> Let's meet a shame. <laughs> Are you going to take over, Alan, or...? Uh, yes, well, uh, hand over to Yan Carell, really, if you can uh, s- stop your share and um, probably be here for a few more minutes in case anyone's got any questions, Max, maybe. And, uh, yeah, uh, Yan Carell, if you're, if you're ready, if you want to take over, mate. Yep. We'll get the session started. Is my screen on, on there now? Yeah, absolutely. We can see it. Good. Okay, so... Um... Alan tricked me into talking about half an hour or so about VBA tips and tricks, probably triggered by some tips and tricks I've been posting on um, LinkedIn. Um, So people who've been seeing those posts might recognize a couple of these. Um, I'll I'll try and explain some more than I did in the very short animated GIF pictures that I put on, on, uh, on LinkedIn. So yeah. Maybe first a short intro. Um, So my name's up there. Uh, I've been working with spreadsheets ever since about 19, let's not lie, 1988, I think. 
Um, starting off with Lotus, I think version, version 2.2 or something really ancient like that. Uh, working my, up, my way up to Quattro Pro and then all of a sudden my company decided that Microsoft was the next big thing. So they purchased um, Excel as part of Office 4.3, if I'm not mistaken. That's Excel 5, the first one that contained VBA. And the rest is history, so, so to speak. That was back in 1996. So I've been writing VBA code for 25 odd years now. So I can safely assume that I am a bit experienced in that. So that's enough about me. Let's go and do some tips and tricks on VBA and the editor. So the first thing I wanted to show you is a couple of little things to have to do with user forms. So let's go there. Um, we have this little user form here, which only has an okay and a cancel button. Let me get rid of those. Start with the clean slate that you always do. And my first tip is if you want your user form to look different from the crowd, then the first thing to do is to change the background color to something like white or something. And if you prefer a different font for all of your controls, change the font here and now, because that font will apply to all of the controls that you later on drag onto your form. So let's just exaggerate today and put it to a font of 24 and use maybe Calibre. That's what I'm typing. And now any control we put on here will have a font of Calibri 24. So let me prove that by opening up the toolbox and just putting a label on there. And there you see it's quite big. And the background is the same as the user form that I just changed into white. So before dragging any control onto your um, canvas, it's a good idea to first set the defaults because they're never going to be the default that um, VBA gives you out of the box. You can't change that. But the first step I always make is change the defaults here on my first empty canvas. Um, most of my user forms need an OK and a cancel button. So let me put a button up there. This is going to be my OK button. And remember, if you're drawing an OK button, let's put a caption of OK that you set the default property to true. Um, by doing that, you make sure that if the user hits the enter key, it actually clicks the OK button. So that's OK. Of course, we need a cancel button too. So I'll just copy this one, copy, paste it here. That's going to be my cancel button. And the cancel button deserves cancel to become true. That way, if the user hits the escape key, automatically the cancel button is clicked. And then of course, you know that in standard dialog boxes, the okay key is always to the left of the cancel key. So please adhere to that as well. Now you may have noticed that um, even though the label respected the background, the OK and cancel buttons are still the stale old light gray. So you have to change those manually as well. So um, all of my forms contain an OK and cancel button of some form or shape. So it would be easy if I could save those edits that I just did. Well, as it turns out, you can sort of. See this control toolbox we have here has the capability of adding tabs to it. So I can right click here, put a new page in it and rename that page, name it my controls, controls. Wow, I'm really bad at typing today. And now I can drag these okay and cancel buttons to the toolbox. And why is that useful? Because I can now drag them onto my form and have OK and cancel on my form without all the editing needed. Because if I click on OK, um, it still has the default set to true and the cancel has the cancel set to true. 
By the way, never combine cancel and default to be both true because that's a bad idea. So I'll change it here. It's either default true or cancel true, not both. Um, the VBA editor is not going to guard you against that mistake. So please make sure that you change those two um, exclusively. And let me get rid of this because it has the wrong setting for OK and cancel. There we go. Um, if you drag controls onto the control two box, by default, they are called new groups. So it's a good idea to maybe rename them. So you can customize them here and put a OK cancel caption on them. You can even change the picture of them, but I'm not going to do it here today. So that way you can hover your mouse over it. And if you have your description right, you can see what they are about. Let's see, I think that was what I had to say about the control toolbox and user forms, but let me return. Yeah, that's it. Good. Uh, by the way, any questions, please post them in the chat and I'll try and um, get into them after my talk because I, I can't keep an eye on the chat and uh, do a presentation at the same time, I'm sorry. Okay, another short tip is about commenting of code blocks. So um, I regularly have the situation where I maybe have a bit in my code that I temporarily want to turn off. And I regularly see people do type um, the apostrophe in front of each line like this. Um, that's not a big deal if it's just three lines of code, but I sometimes have a bit that's maybe 20 lines of code. And the VBA editor actually helps you with that because you can just select the lines you want to comment. And then if you made sure that you have your edit toolbar visible, there it is, you can click on this comment block button to comment the block and you can click on uncomment block to uncomment them. Um, there's even more stuff here because you can actually um, modify this toolbar. Let me do that. So let's customize the toolbar. Now, please ignore this dialogue. We're going to right click on the comments button again and put an ampersand in front of the C and also change its, its appearance by clicking on image and text. And you'll see the comment block text appear there and I'll explain to you later why that's important. And I'll do the same on the on comment box block and I'll put the ampersand in front of the U and select image and test text. So why do I do this? That's because now I can hit Alt C and comment the block, Alt C. And I can hit Alt U to uncomment the block. And because I'm coding, I'm usually on my keyboard rather than my mouse. So that's a pretty useful piece of advice, I would say. Okay, back to Excel. Um, some of you might have noticed that I click hyperlinks here. Um, that's simply using the hyperlink function um, followed by the pound sign to make sure that it's an internal hyperlink to this document. And then in column E, I have the name of a subroutine and in column F, I have just a text to display. So I can now just click the auto syntax check option hyperlink and it takes me to the routine which I want to talk about. Um, beginner coders, um, often start with Excel, the VBA editor in its default settings. And which means that if you're typing a statement and move to the next line, because maybe there's something you want to copy from that line, like suppose you have a really long variable name, you get interrupted by the VBA editor stating that you've made a mistake. Um, 99 times out of 100, I didn't make this mistake. I just wasn't finished typing the statement and I wanted to copy something from elsewhere. So this message box is highly interrupted for me. Um, it's very easy to turn that off. You go into tools, options, and just uncheck this box, the auto syntax check. And while you're at it, make sure that you check the box require variable declaration over here so that um, option explicit gets written on top of your modules. So having clicked that box, if I now move to the next statement without correcting my mistake, I don't get interrupted by the box. 
but still my line turns red to indicate that something's wrong. And it happens like two times a year that I need to go back in to the tools options to check that box again, because I can't find what my mistake is. Um, mostly it's probably about, um, you know, missing a closing parentheses and stuff like that. So go into tools, options, turn off the auto syntax check because it gets in the way. Right, I'm going to go to moving around in your code now. Why is this that slow? Because I forgot the hyperlink. No, no problem. Um, what I did here is I made sure that we can only see one subroutine at a time. Um, that is a setting in tools options as well. And it's the default to full module view checkbox here. So let me turn that on so we can see all routines that are in this module. Um, if I'm coding, I pretty often jump up and down my code, um, scrolling up, coming back down, copying stuff from left to right and stuff like that. Um, the difficulty with that is that it's pretty often hard to trace back to the position where you left from. So for example, suppose we're on this message box statement, I now hit the control home key because I want to go to the top of my module for my declarations. How do I get back? Um, the shortcut key for getting back is control shift F2. So that's on your function row, your function key F2. It just takes you, it doesn't, good. Well, normally control shift F2 would have taken me back to message box. Today it doesn't. Just remember that control shift F2 might take you back to where you started from. Um, another thing to recall is that if you are on a variable, you can right click on the variable to find its declaration by clicking on definition. Um, that's also a shortcut key. You can hit shift F2 to jump to the declaration line as well. Now, this isn't a very good example because the declaration line is like two lines up from where I'm using the variable. But as you can imagine, if this is a constant that is maybe global to the project, that might be on a totally different module altogether. Let me see what's up next. Full module view, I talked about that. Debugging tips, right. Um, if you're debugging, and let me start debugging by hitting F8 once, um, there's a number of options that you can use in VBA that a lot of people don't seem to know about. For example, you can right click here and tell the VBA editor to um, go further from there. Or you can simply drag the yellow icon here and drag it to wherever you want to continue. For example, to here. Um, if I F8 through this, I can enter a number. Let's just do 25. This is going to be the top number where we are going to stop. Now, suppose we have a problem when the loop counter in, is equal to, let's say 20. Uh, we can of course hit F8 like 50 times until we get a 20, but we could also add a watch for the loop counter add watch and fill in the equals to 20 and then select break when value equals true and click OK. Now, if I simply hit the run key, as you can see, the value of this statement has turned to, turned to true. So counter is now 20. So that's a really quick way to get to the position where your code errored last time. Um, it might be at row 1 million of your spreadsheet. So you could, you know, put a watch on CT equals 1 million. By the way, you can simply add, um, edit these expressions by just clicking in here and maybe changing that to 22, hitting enter. And then we can F5 again, and it will run to counter equals 22. So there you go, that's um, one debugging tip that might be useful. Um, and by the way, this expression is remembered. So if I now F5 on this routine, I will, it will run through this until the counter equals 22 again. 
uh, okay, 30. And the counter is going to be 22. Um, other stuff that's useful when you're debugging is the locals window. Locals window is going to show you the values of all the local variables for this routine. And it's very easy to keep tabs on what's going on here. So if I F8 through this, you will see the values change, this counter turning to 23, 24, and et cetera, and the sum adding up. Um, also in this um, locals window, you can actually click in a counter in, in the value and, and change it. So I can actually change the end of the loop, loop to 40 here. It's probably not going to work because I've already passed uh, the, the for start statement already. But let's see what happens. It actually works. Of course, that's something that you need to be careful with because you're changing stuff mid midway. Um, you might have the, uh, skipped a couple of initialization um, statements while you were in the middle changing values of variables, but it can be very useful when you're troubleshooting your code. Right, debugging tips. Let's see what else I had in score. Ah, uh, yes, this is a slightly more com complicated subject. Um, actually, this was a request, I think it was by Craig, if I remember correctly. Um, we spoke about error handling in, in, I think, a discussion on LinkedIn. And I mentioned something about, well, you can cascade errors up to the call stack. Uh, so Craig actually triggered me into, well, why don't you explain us a bit about that stuff while you're at it anyway. Um, but let me trace back first. Let's just start with why would you use error handling in VBA to begin with? So this is a very simple routine. It asks for a denominator and a divisor, and then it tries to divide the two. So you can imagine if I enter a zero in this input box, that this is going to give you a division by zero and um, error message. So if I F5 this and I ent enter 20, and then I enter zero, I get the famous division by zero mistake. And I don't even get past this statement unless I fix things. So VBA has a number of um, options to actually um, help you with this. So option one is why don't we just ignore all errors? So we put in the on error resume next statement and just like we're idiots, we just run this, try to divide 10 by zero and it will give you 10 divided by zero is infinite, which is kind of neat. Uh, when I when I devised this example, I didn't even know that uh, VBA was capable of showing infinite when you try to divide one by zero. But it, actually it does. So uh, it looks like the variable called D result actually has a result called infinite. So that's probably a very specific special case. Um, that's one example, but you know, if you're ignoring errors, that's sometimes very useful. So for example, if you try to set a worksheet to a variable name and that worksheet doesn't exist. So that's something that I use regularly. Um, I know that worksheet might not be there. So I put an on error resume next statement in there. And then I check if an error has happened. If not, then apparently that work worksheet was there. And if it's not, then well, then worksheet wasn't there and I need to do something else. So the better option of ignoring errors is of course trying to prevent errors. Um, so that gets you in all sorts of loops where you actually you know, ask for an entry, then check the value of the entry, like is anything entered at all? Um, is the entry numeric? Show a message box, um, loop back if we didn't apply stuff like that. And uh, this can be very, uh, become very complicated very quickly because there might be various different situations that you run into. For example, um, the input box, um, the VBA input box doesn't allow you to set a type of data to give you. So um, a user can enter anything into it like ABC. 
um, which is why I have this second test here that says whether the, the entry is actually numeric. And I'll give you a number, please. So um, yeah, making sure no er errors appear at all can be challenging, uh, but it's still, I think, the best way to do it. And of course, you would normally create a function that says, okay, here's an entry, check whether it's numeric. If not, give me a false or something like that. Um, I've now programmed everything in line, which is rather ugly and of course not the neatest way to do it. So now we get to catching errors. So suppose I made some mistakes in my coding. And I'm just going to skip this. Okay, let me skip this. Suppose I made a mistake and I still and I stay man, I still managed to enter a zero to divide by. Um, what's necessary is a statement that tells the VBA editor to where to go when an error happens, and that is done by using the on error and then a label. And the label is entered here. And you express a label by typing a word entered by a column like this. So when I hit F8 now, what should happen is the, the cursor should jump to the message box because I'm trying to divide by zero. And that's exactly what happens. And we're currently now in error handling states. So I can show a message to the user, for example which says, okay, we had an error. This is the error message. We have overflow. Sorry, something happened here. Um, inside an error, an error handler, there's a couple of ways to exit the error handler without having uh, causing any trouble. The first method is just leaving any statements out of it and letting VBA run to the end sub that will automatically get a VBA out of the error handling state. Um, another way is to have um, one of two different resume statements. And I'm going to use that now here. Um, there are several options here. We can have resume tidy up. The other one is resume without anything behind it. And then we have resume next. Resume takes you back to the statement that caused the error immediately. So to demonstrate, if I now F8, I get taken back to the um, division here. So that's resume. Resume next takes you to the statement immediately below the statement that caused the error as you can see. And finally, resume tidy up takes me to the label called tidy up. And I always make a habit of having a tidy up section immediately above my error handling section so that I can do the tidy up there, like setting objects to nothing, turning back on calculation, um, turning on enable events for the application, things like that. Because if you let the routine just end here, you might end up with your workbook in manual calculation mode. So that is a simple error handler. And now let's go to using cascading error handlers. So in many Excel projects, we don't just have one routine that we're calling. Um, the one routine might call another routine and then that other routine might call that yet another routine. And as it happens, you never can really predict where your error is going to happen because you know, a user might um, do unexpected entries or stuff or um, Excel might have a bug that you weren't aware of or something like that. So let me demonstrate what I've created here. So I'm going to F8 through this. The first statement is an on error go to log error, which tells me that if an error ha happens in this subroutine or in any of the subsequent routines, take me back to this error handling routine here. 
So now I'm going to jump to next sub one, which in turn also has an on error lock error statement, which will also take me to its error handler over here. And I'm jumping to the next sub two, which is, so currently I call stack. into next sub one there. And currently I'm in next sub two here. And again, I'm turning on error handling for this routine. And this is where we are actually going to force an error. So I'm going to do that in the division by zero and it's And I'll get back to that in a minute. The error number is probably going to be more than zero. So we're jumping to the else part of this. And that is because this is the first position where we have an error to begin with. And now I'm here and I'm collecting a number of things. I'll scroll up. Everything here so that everything's visible. And here I'm raising an error again. Remember, we are in error handling state and raising an error in a routine that is in error handling state will in fact trigger the error handler of the routine that called the routine that you're in. So next sub two was called by next sub one here. So this error is going to push me up to the error handler over here. And when I'm raising an error, I need to tell the VBA editor what the error number is. And uh, it's customary to then use the VB object error constant because that gives you an error number in a range that VBA doesn't um, use. And the value of that VB object error is actually a negative number. And I'm abusing that information in the if error number equals is less than zero over here. So what am I telling that error? I'm going to pass it where the error message. So I'm going to F8 now, and it will give, as you can see, it pushed me back to next sub one in its error handler. And I'm not testing for less than zero. It's now going to be less than zero and I just want to repeat the information that was passed to here in the description. Let me show you what's in the description now. Control G. So this is what's currently in the description. So it tells me that the last error happened in next sub two and that the error was error number 11 and the description was division by zero. And so now what it's doing is it's going to raise another error so that we get pushed up in the call stack to our first routine. And it's going to add next sub one prior to the description that I already have. And now we're back in the calling routine in the first routine that we had. And this routine doesn't need any um, if error number less than zero because we want to display the error here. So let's display the error. And so now you can see that by um, the strings that I added in front of the error description, I now have an error message which shows me the call stack stating error next sub one, next sub two. And then the final statement is the actual error message in the routine where it happened. Maybe you write it to a text log or something um, or maybe um, ask the user if they want to um, have that information copied and sent in an email to me so I can uh, maybe troubleshoot. So that is one technique to maybe do um, error handling. Let me stop this. Check, double check, how am I on time, Alan? Uh, what is this one? <laughs> yeah, I think we're doing okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. I'm kind of racing through it. That's okay, though. 
Okay, so that's enough about error handling and stuff. Um, that was the VBA part I was I scheduled to talk about. Um, maybe it's time for a couple of questions. Sure, I think there was some questions in the chat. I've um, been doing a lot of bits, haven't watched it intensely, but I'm pretty sure there was some in there. Uh, the, does anybody want to ask Jan Crow a question? If, if you had one in the chat, would you like to ask it? Your audio was skipping a little bit, Jan Crow, at moments. Not, not that oh. bad, but just the odd word would kind of get mm. missed. Just, you Sorry know. about that. No, it's fine. It's just, it wasn't. It wasn't too terrible. It's just. It's probably my internet connection that was. <laughs> Let me see what's in the chat. <laughs> One divided by zero equals infinite Easter egg. Yeah. I mean, if any anyone has a question, maybe repeat it in the chat so it bubbles up at the top instead of me having to look for them. Where can one find the best error handling manual? I think a very good book is the professional Excel development book. Let me just pull that out of my bookcase <laughs> for a second and show it to the screen. Uh, is it, why is it, is it visible to you guys? It seems blurred to me. A uh, little bit blurred, yeah. Yeah, well. See your, your background here. Yeah. You have to put it in front of your face. <laughs> oh, that's it, probably. <laughs> oh, no, it still does it right now. Uh, well, whatever. It's called Professional Excel Development by Rob Bovey, Dennis Wallentine, Steve Bullen, and John Green. It's the Bible for anyone who's, will, who's interested in programming for Excel. Um, the book is rather old, but, you know, VBA is decades older, so it doesn't matter much. Um, let me reshare my screen. Share. Okay. Now, where did the chat window go? I'm not, used, I'm not used to using Teams because, you know. Well, I am, but I still get messed up with it. <laughs> yeah, it keeps moving things on me. Yeah, it's all over. <clears throat> okay. Um, there was a question about when declaring commonly used variables. Do you prefer to declare them where they are used or declare them globally to be used as needed? Um, I think the... Um, most professional programmers prefer to declare at the lowest possible level. So always declare in your subroutine in your function, unless it is a variable that you maybe, you know, change once in the entire project. Um, you know, stuff like constants, like the name of the project, um, a connection string to a deba database, which you read once for maybe the, the grid somewhere. Uh, Keep it simple and um, declare things at the lowest possible level. Yeah, someone posted the link to the book. That's good. Thank you. Any more questions? Any burning questions you want me answered right away? If not, let me just type my email address in the chat window. If you have more questions, just pop me an email and I'll try and answer them as quickly as I can. Good. I'm doing away with the chat window. So um, Ellen kind me, kindly permitted me to do a small demonstration of a um, tool that I try to sell from my website, which is called RefTree Analyzer, uh, which is installed in this machine, of course. Um, it is a tool that makes it easier to manage your... Good, it's always good if errors happen while you're presenting. Not to worry. Um, where is that folder? There we go. Interesting. 
<laughs> shit happens. Just give me a sec. I need to grasp one or two files from my main system. This is a virtual machine that I'm presenting from. And VMware is giving me havoc. It always does when you're presenting. <laughs> Don't worry. We'll get there. It's all part of fun, isn't it? Yes, it is. Try again. Oh, come on. Cancel. I'll do it differently. Just a sec. I'm going just to share another portion of my screen. There. Share that. Is my Excel window visible now? Yep. Good. Um, oh God, how do I get rid of that sharing stuff of Zoom? Oh, we can't see that. It's just bugging your screen. No, it's just on top of my uh, off the, on yeah. top of my ribbon, so I can't do anything. <laughs> Never mind. Um, um, if you've ever used the tried to trace what a formula is pointing to, and I have a monster up here which is from an actual project a customer once sent me who has all sorts of really silly uh, tab names that resemble cell references and stuff and formulas. Um, it can be a drag. I mean, you can go to the formula tab and you can click trace precedence and it'll show you pretty arrows, but they're not really that helpful because uh, a number of references in this formula points to other tabs like this one over here. Um, and um, Excel actually collects those into this tiny little, um, let's call it a table over here. And what's really not that obvious is that you have to double click the dash line over here to uh, get a go-to box. And then it gives you the go-to box with something where you can click on here but you can't really see what it's pointing to because it first prepends it with the file name, which is really long. So you have to click here and scroll to the right. And well, needless to say, this is a pain in the, what's it called, especially if you want to look at all five of them or all six of them. So that's terrible. Um, so I devised a tool that makes it easier. Um, you can click precedence over here and I hope the dialog box will show for you guys does this show up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, good, because if I do this on Teams, I get a, black, a blue square over here. Um, so that makes it really easy to navigate through whatever's in the formula. Um, and if I click on one of the cell addresses here, you'll see it get highlighted in the original formula over there so that you know what part of the formula we're looking at and what cell is actually belonging to that. And if you look at the grid over here, you'll notice that um, you also get pushed to the cell that we're currently, that I've clicked on right now. So, and I, of course, this is also keyboard friendly. So I can just hit the down arrow key to navigate through all of the links that this complicated formula is using. And it's highlighting the parts in the formula here and it's highlighting the area on the screen there. And if I click escape, hit, uh, hit the escape button, it's just going to take me back to the cell where I left off. Um, alternatively, if I want to stay at the position where I am right now, I can also click on the close button and it will just leave me in this cell, which I'm not going to do because I want to return to the formula that, was, that I was auditing. So that's one mode that it has. Um, of course, it also has a dependence view. And then another mode is where you can actually visualize what this formula is pointing to, and it will draw some boxes on this sheet like this. Um, the advantage of this view is that you actually get a preview of the area that the formula is using. So inside the formula, it's actually using information from the table called IL table NIBOT, um, column H to M. And if I click on this box, it will take me there. So it's actually the formula I just highlighted is taking information from this table. And if I click inside the table, I get taken back to the sheet with the cell. 
that I was uh, auditing. And then the green cells are actually links to um, cells on the same sheet. But if that cell is out of so outside of the shows you what the value And if you want to go to that cell, you simply click on this box and it will take you to the cell with that value and you can click here to go back. Just a sec. It tells me my internet connection is unstable. Uh, hopefully you can still see what I'm doing. Yeah, we can see if on it. He says. No problem. Good. I'll reshare my screen as soon as I can. Okay. Just need to find the file I wanted to share. There it is. Continue. I hate it when stuff doesn't work the way you were expecting it to work, but whatever, share my screen. So another feature of the tool is um, checking out what your Excel objects are doing in your file. So for example, in this file, um, I have loads of stuff um, on purpose, of course, like uh, a pivot table that's pointing to an external source, um, I have all sorts of controls on here. <clears throat> and of course, as you probably know, controls can also point, to, also point to cells. For example, this box over here is actually pointing to cell B3 on this worksheet. So for that, my ref tree analyzer has an object references button, which analyzes everything in the sheet and then gives you a long list. Let me fold it. And so it's giving you a view with all the worksheets that are in there. And for every worksheet, it's going to show you the different types of objects that are on there. For example, we have a checkbox here and it's actually trying to highlight the checkbox so that you so that it's easy to find. Um, because for example, if you go in, if you use the built-in stuff that Excel has, you click on home and you click on, you know, the selection pane over here it does list you list the objects for you, but it still it doesn't scroll to the object when you click on it. So if if that object happens to be outside of the viewable range, you're not going to find it. So Ref Tree Analyzer actually fixes that because it scrolls the object into view automatically. One example is this text box over here, and then it tells you that the text box actually has a formula pointing to cell. B3 on the pivot sheet. That's the same sheet, by the way, and all sorts of other stuff. So ref tree analyzer, object references. And the final thing I wanted to demonstrate is the circular references that it's capable of looking up. Circular reference, where the heck is that? Okay, zoom, share screen. Is my file up again? Yeah. Yep. So um, I just opened up an Excel file which contained a number of circular references and you're probably familiar with this one. Every, I think everyone using Excel for more than 10 minutes has, has seen this. Um, unfortunately, Excel doesn't make it easy for you to find out what's causing this circular reference error. Um, in this case, it does show these red arrows here. So that's a nice indication. And it says circular references on the, uh, below here in the taskbar. And then on the formula tab, in the error checking section here, it does show you circular references. However, in this particular file, there's more than one circle. 
but Excel only shows you one. So let's see how many other circles there are by just clicking the circular references button over here. And my tool tells you there's actually three of them. There's this one, there's that one, and there's that one. And to make it more complicated, these three are also intertwined. So the circle runs from these four, but then there's these four, and then there's these four. So it's, there's actually really um, three circles which touch each other on one edge. And I think my Rift Analyzer is one of the very few tools that is capable of actually finding all of the circles that are in a workbook. Well, then there's a bunch of other stuff like um, adding a table of contents to your sheet and stuff that I won't highlight now. I think I've been talking for long enough um, for now. So yeah, with that, I would like to thank the audience for listening to me. And um, should there be any questions, let me know. Um, if you're interested in this tool, just pop me an email. I've mentioned my email address in the chat. Or you can just Google for my name and my website will probably turn up at the top. Yes, indeed. Let me just put your email in the chat again. Oh. Any questions for the Ancrell Far Away team? I think there were some questions. Uh, I just copied one from YouTube a minute ago into the, the chat window. Um, one thing um sorry just say uh, i think when uh, jan said something about when he uses teams and he gets this black uh, like his screen is blue uh, i think that's because he's oh. when you're sharing a screen you have to share not as a window but as a screen if you generally if you do that as a, as a window like an excel window only that's when all these pop-ups don't show properly basically that's the main reason that's what i've noticed anyway so Thanks, Raj. Yeah, I, I, I'm aware of that. Um, I, I do quite a number of presentations. Sure. The problem is my screen is a 38 inch. So okay. if I share my entire screen, people with a, a 13 inch laptop will not be able to see anything. Okay. And no, also awesome. it saves me from accidentally showing my email to someone who <laughs> isn't supposed to see that. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> No, that's it. <laughs> but yeah, point taken. That was one of the reasons why I was using a virtual machine um, at the beginning of my talk, because then I can just safely show the entire desktop without risking showing anything that you're not supposed to be seeing. Thanks, though. Any other questions? Um, can you see the chat window at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. You seem to build a lot into your tools that VBA cannot do. Are you using some kind of MS developer tools available only to commercial developers? No, not at all. 99% um, of my tools are 100% straightforward VBA coding. Yeah, um, yeah. If, if there's anything specific, um, William, then I'd, I'd be happy to um, explain how I did stuff or at least point at a source that makes it easy to find it. Yeah. So young Carl, a question from me. Um, people have been asking me for the last uh, couple of weeks, will VBA still exist in the near future? And what about Office scripts? No question. Yeah, that's a question that resurfaces like every other year or so. Um, there's, there are trillions of lines of VBA code out there. There are billions of workbooks containing VBA that people rely on. So VBA is not going to be removed from the product anytime soon. Uh, it'll probably take another decade or three or four before Microsoft will even consider cutting off VBA. Okay. Um, that being said, um, if you're in a corporation and many of your colleagues are using Excel online or maybe using Excel inside a Teams environment. Um, if you're sharing information with other people, 
using Excel online, then VBA is um, a no-go area because VBA won't work with Excel online. Mm -hmm. And that is why Microsoft introduced um, Office scripts. Um, and I have seen that recently Microsoft has also enabled Office script to run on Excel desktop. So that's good mm -hmm. news as well. So how about the learning curve, learning the Office script? Well, Office already... script itself is relatively easy because it is JavaScript, but they offer a, an Office script recorder, which mm -hmm. records all of the syntax for you. And then it's not very difficult to find help on JavaScript online because JavaScript is such a hugely um, used language out there because all of the web developers are using uh, JavaScript, um, you know, to do, um, uh, you know, browser automation and stuff like that. So it's not like it's difficult to find information about JavaScript itself. It's rather difficult to find information about how to address Excel using JavaScript. And for that purpose, they added the script recorder. Okay. So yeah, I've been work. I've been, you know, playing with it in the past couple of weeks for a little bit, and I was pleasantly surprised how much it already is capable of. Mm -hmm. It's nowhere near VBA. No, it is not. Uh, no. Not by a long shot, but it it allows you to do most of the basic stuff, like you know, entering information in cells, doing basic formatting. Mm -hmm. um, adding a pivot table, adding a chart, changing formatting of stuff. So yeah, it's it's getting there, and they're adding stuff every month or yeah. so. So it's it's quickly quickly going as well. Presumably, okay, there will will there ever be event handlers in it? That there doesn't seem to be anything there at the moment. Um, good question. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say anything about hmm. that. <laughs> Um, but I, I would hope that they will add at least the basic stuff like uh, when a cell gets edited and stuff like that because that is really basic stuff that, that you pretty often need when you're you know, automating anything in Excel. The, uh, the Office add-in stuff has, uh, has event handlers. So it's there in JavaScript, it's just not there in Office Script. Exactly, yeah. Oh. So it is possible to get at it, is it? It is possible. Um, it's just not possible in the Office Script editing environment. Okay. You have to jump through a whole set of hoops to get your Office JavaScript development, development environment working. Uh, which a, a number of MPPs and I are currently underway trying to digest all of that. Um, so hopefully within a couple of months, we will be capable of posting videos on how stuff like that is done and everything. But don't hold your breath. We're still at the very beginning of that project. <laughs> right. Sounds rather out of my grade, that. <laughs> Yes, well, you can imagine if four MVPs are struggling to get that working, um, it's, it's not for the faint at heart to, you know, get started. But, mm. you know, once, once the instructions are there, it's not really that complicated either. It's just the first steps that the first people who, you know, try to dive in there need to figure out and then, you know, write, write to the, the steps that you need to take down on a piece of paper and publish it on the blog and then the rest is history. Hey, another question. People who just started out learning Excel, you know, they want to learn about, uh, obviously also about Power Query, Power Pivot. Should they still go into uh, learning VBA and Office Scripts? What's your point on that one? If I would have to put my money on it, I would say, you know, if you're working, if you're using Excel as a, as a spreadsheet tool, doing your daily job as a financial, for example, I would probably advise to start looking at office script rather than vba okay especially if you're in a corporate environment where they have all the bells and whistles of office 365 and everything mm -hmm. um, that then it makes sense to start with office script rather than vba okay okay 
in the past, I've seen a certain number of spreadsheets where the sheet itself was just a blank canvas. All the calculation was done in VBA. Never totally happy with them, but uh, you know, I, I've struggled and worked and corrected things on them. Made, but uh, now, I just want to. Do you think that uh, Excel, Lambda formulas, and spreadsheet formulas are themselves becoming a competitor? That rather than writing a UDF, you can write it in just the uh, well, it's a lambda function. It's not there yet. It's not out yet. But uh... yeah, they've. They, I think they have just rolled it out to everyone on Insider now. Okay. Um, so if you don't have it yet and you are on Insider, remember to open Excel and maybe have it check for updates. Um, it might give you a surprise that it, that you actually get them. I would say that Lambda is far better than any uh, VBA UDF if it comes to things like performance. And not unimportantly, it will also run on your iPhone, on your um, iPad, on Excel Online, and on any Mac machine, which is not something you can say of a VBA UDF. So yeah, it, it's worth learning lambdas if you are into creating your own functions. Thank you. Oh, cool. Yeah. Just read in the chat. William, the last question. Who's going to say something? Ah, here. <laughs> <laughs> we shall see who's going to do the lender meetup. Any volunteers? You volunteering, Peter? If you haven't seen anything on Lambdas, Lambdas yet, let me at least post a link to one of my articles on them. Just give me a sec to find it. I just wrote this morning a, a, a rolling future, the, future, the forecast onto actuals with just one Lambda function. And you just specify where, where the actuals are and how many periods forecast you want. As a and job done, you know that it's, uh, and then you can apply it to as many different data sets on the sheet as you want. That uh, and sort of you write it once, use it everywhere. But, uh, so it does seem to have a lot, a lot of potential in that context. Yeah, they certainly do, and it's not easy to actually copy a lambda from one worksheet to another because a workbook because mm. all you need to do is write the formula in a cell and copy that cell to the other workbook. Copy a cell. Okay, I won't, I've never got below copying a sheet, but... Uh, as long as yeah. you copy a cell that, that entertains that lambda, it will take it with it. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. I've explained that in the in the basics article, if I remember correctly. Oh, where is this article? There's a link in the chat. Okay. Two links, to be precise. I think you've got some Office Script stuff at your site as well, don't you, Yankro? Yeah. Yeah. I did see a stream of links on Office Scripts. Oh, For anyone who's interested in getting involved with it. Hey, link swiftly in the chat. Okay. Yeah, yeah Office Script is the bee's knees right, uh, right now. I mean, <laughs> you can call an Office Script from a Power Automate flow. So I have an office script that allows you to add a table of content to a work to a workbook. And then you can create a flow that calls that script for every workbook in an in, in a SharePoint folder. 
So you can add a table of contents to 100,000 files in your SharePoint if you like. I'm not sure if your administrator would be happy with you, but you can. <laughs> yep, correct, Bloom, what you've said in the chat. Uh, copying those links. Yeah. Uh, this transcript won't be available when Zoom finishes. You can't export that chat to somewhere. Um, we can, yeah. Know. It's just yeah. something that's not the standard, so we could do it. But yeah, if you grab a copy of those links, it's no problem. Yeah, it's not like they're hard to find. No, <laughs> no. Good. Well, just open them now and leave them open in your browser for months. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what, what I, I do. do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions for Fiona and Krell? Otherwise, I'll, I'll stop the YouTube stream soon and people can just chat a bit more informally if they want. Well, this is pretty relaxed at the moment. Uh, Roxana wants me to crack open a workbook that's been protected, so it's... Hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's frighteningly easy to crack the worksheet protection, but that probably is common knowledge. Okay, if there's no more questions, I'm going to close the YouTube stream, keep the, the Zoom going. Yep. Uh, so that's just finished.